today. My name's Chris. We've got some interesting things going on here today. started. Uh, last time you were here we worked on one of these little engines and demonstrated how it would operate. That's kind of more or less a permanent stand for, for these small ones but I also wheel it around and use it for other things. What we're going to do today is we've got a larger engine, 160 horsepower. This is made by Solar. Uh, it's a T62-32 engine. They use frequently in uh, helicopters, airplanes. Originally they were removed from generator sets. Today, uh, we've got a, a test stand that I custom made using a kit that was produced by a company in California to convert this engine for use in actually a rotaway helicopter. And we've got an actual rotaway frame that I've extensively modified uh, to create this little demonstrator. This is used as a training aid, demonstrator, uh, or a showroom piece, however you wanted to do it. Um, the rotor system uh, has been modified and I know there's going to be a lot of people that are going to look at this and say hey you didn't use AN bolts and this and that. Keep in mind this is never going to be a flying machine. It's to demonstrate only that the engine functions in the capacity of a, of a powertrain for a helicopter or a two passenger one. Um, we've got an electronic governor here uh, that will be connected up in a, in a minute. We're going to, I'll, we'll start connecting everything up and then we'll get ready to fire this thing up. Up left, we'll be measuring the torque. We're not going to be do that today. The only thing we're going to be interested on here is the EGT. Uh, injector pressure, main fuel, pump pressure. I have boost pump and I actually have fuel flow. We can monitor the oil pressure, compressor discharge, which helps regulate the uh, fuel control, and then the air inlet temperature. <clears throat> this will be all temperature compensated if we're running on the dyno. We're not going to do that today. Basically, uh, we're going to manual gauge on there and we're going to only monitor the EGT on the screen here. And we've got basically two cables here. One of these is going to go to the torque motor. It's going to provide power to run the actuator on the fuel control. And the other one uh, goes to a magnetic pickup to tell how fast it's going. The engine right here, there's a planetary gear set with 20 holes in it. And it actually, every time it hits a hole, it'll register. So we <clears throat> set the, normally they set the governor up to run 20 pulses per revolution of engine. I changed it a little bit. I'm doing 120 pulses. It gives me finer resolution on the control. I got an exciter. Takes 24 volts. Right there. This puts out, it's like a, like a spark plug in a car. Extremely high voltage though. Uh, wouldn't want to get zapped by it. Okay, we come over here to the start fuel. We test all the controls to make sure everything's functioning correctly because we want to be able to control and shut down the engine. We have 24 volt master. We're not going to use 12 volts. The fuel boost. The exit comes on and is working. That's supplying 4 to 5 PSI to the fuel control. I have a safety bypass that allows the engine to bypass uh, low oil pressure and things on startup. That's the exciter. And then we have a start fuel which makes a little click. And you have another one. So it's, that's telling me that all the, all the controls that I need to be able to shut down this engine in whatever case uh, I can do, and if I, if, if I had a real emergency, I can just hit the 24 volt master and everything goes off. I'm ready to fire this thing up. Uh, I've tested all the circuits, they seem to work fine. Uh, we don't know how this is going to run because we haven't tested it yet, but we're going to find out here in just a minute. So, the first thing I do is I turn on the boost pump, and that's just it's not letting fuel go anywhere except into the fuel control. We turn on the exciter. I work, use two hands for this. I, as soon as the exciter comes on, I hit this engine start and then start fuel and then main fuel and we should be running.
because this is not in a helicopter, we don't want to run this up to full RPM. When you when you look at the readout there, it said 609 RPM. That's actually 60% of the engine speed, so that's just above idle, and that's about the point where the the clutch engages over here. If you want to come over here, we'll go through this a little bit. There's a centrifugal clutch right in here that engages somewhere around 55% and starts transmitting power through here uh, in a three to one reduction through a coupling. We have a sprag clutch here, which only goes one way. So if you had an engine problem, the engine died, uh, uh, the rotor system will still keep on going and it will have tail rotor drive into the, into the gearbox. This is actually a sprint car rear end made by Speedway Automotive and the manufacturer has modified it to work for their needs. They make the brackets that mount to the frame that holds, those are anti-rotation brackets. <clears throat> and and the, you, the fact that you've got quick change gear set on the back here allows you to adjust the RPM to whatever you need to. We get 520 RPM out of this rotor system for this particular helicopter. The, right off the back of the engine we get 6,000 RPM. It goes to a 3 to 1 reduction here so it gives you a little over 2,000 RPM into the box. We have a little bit of a step up here that steps the tail rotor up I'm guessing around to 2,500 and that'll go out to another gearbox on the tail rotor system when it's connected. We're not, we're not doing that here. We've, we've got the, the tail boom blocked off and I've got just the drive sitting there. We end up with around 2,000 foot-pounds of torque on the rotor head, which is quite, a, quite, quite pretty good, spinning two blades. I think the blades are around 12 feet in diameter and they probably weigh 25, 28 pounds a piece. Uh, there again, we can't put that on here without the rest of the airframe. The thing will be jumping all over the place. So we keep the vibration down, uh, I mean, run it not, not to exceed 75%. The uh, <clears throat> airframe, um, Pretty much uh, was a stock airframe. We just basically added the base base to it so it can roll around on wheels. The engine is quite similar to the way the manufacturer for the kit uh, to convert these these things to turbine engines uh, had intended for it. The drive to the tail rotor, uh, I redesigned and changed all that because of what we had here as a demonstrator. And I wasn't going to connect up uh, alternator and other things that would no normally be connected on the helicopter. So that this all this bracketry down here is was custom made for this installation. We'll talk a little bit about the rotor head. This is pretty much stock. I've, I've modified the bracket that goes with this from the original intention, and I've tightened things up so that we don't get much movement in the in the swash plate because I don't want those flopping around. Uh, all these links and everything are, are designed to control both collective and and uh, cyclic uh, motion. This would actually control the collective. It would come from another thing. This will move down. It will move the whole rotor, uh, the whole swash plate assembly up and down. These connect to the to the blades, uh, to each each blade, so that the whole thing would be creating lift. In a cyclic movement, you have a control connecting to one of these. So if you wanted to make a right bank or a left bank, uh, the control input happens 90 degrees ahead of where you want to go. So if you want to go forward, the actual input uh, takes place on the left side of the helicopter, depending on which way the rotation is. Uh, so that the, the change takes over takes place over 90 degree uh, angle in the rotation of the, of the rotor head. Uh, there really isn't a whole lot to this. I mean, this rotor head's not a bad design, as far as I can see. It uses an elastomeric bearing in here. It allows allows this thing to move around. These things are all adjusted when you do a track and balance on the helicopter. And there again, I've modified this quite a bit. I've left the boots off. I've tightened things up, and I'm not using the correct hardware that this thing would normally have to be actually flight worthy. Matter of fact, this whole thing is not to be used in an aircraft is only for ground demonstration. The turbine engine, the gearbox, and the transmission could all be used in a real, air, in a, in a real helicopter installation uh, because those were designed for that. But a lot of the modifications I did uh, to other parts would negate any use in, in an aircraft. That's pretty much it. That's just one use for these engines. Uh, we put them in cars, put them, put them in airplanes, helicopters, 160 horsepower. It's a pretty versatile plant. Very reliable. Uh, 
uh, very little to go wrong with them, uh, much better than a reciprocating engine. Things like this, uh, this is kind of a special request from someone. Uh, mostly what I do is I rebuild the engines, I completely dismantle them. Uh, parts today are pretty hard to find because they're obsolete engine uh, from the 1960s. They're not especially fuel efficient. Uh, but still, they're pretty much a favorite amongst helicopter and airplane guys uh, from getting rid of a piston engine to going into a turbine in the experimental world. Uh, I, I do all the reconditioning of the engine, uh, rebalance the rotor system, test the engine uh, on a test stand uh, to make sure it runs good. Uh, I, I play with a lot of these engines for a lot of different things. Uh, this one right here is as a 95 horsepower one, just happens to be on the test stand that I'm using to supply the power and the fuel to this thing. I didn't build a dedicated uh, stand uh, only because it doesn't warrant it. That's pretty much it.